Hi there, this is Chris Chubnicka, Motor Legends. This is the first in a general series about motorcycle clothing. Today we're going to talk about jackets. In future reviews we're going to be talking about helmets, boots, gloves and riding pants. Now the idea here is to try to help those who are perhaps more recent converts to motorcycling. There's a lot of gear out there and if you're new to all of this, it can be a little bit bewildering. Browsing the shelves of your local mega store won't help and rarely are the staff going to care enough to want to help you find what's best for you. Surfing the internet can bring you into contact with lots of people who want to sell you stuff and lots of people who want to give you their honest opinion. But nobody's going to go to great lengths to explain stuff. And the truth is that you can waste many hours watching videos and end up pretty much none the wiser. Now I've made it clear that we produce this video to help those who are new to motorcycling. So if you know already everything there is to know, then go no further. You're going to find this video boring. But here's the thing. There are lots of people who have been riding for years who know very little about gear, about how it works and how it has developed, particularly over the last 10 years or so. This I know because I was one of those people. When I first took up biking, I got myself a leather suit, a leather jacket and a matching pant. I rode everywhere in that combo, come rain, come cold, come shine. And I suppose I survived. I wasn't sufficiently into it to seek out other options. I merely came to the view that, fun as motorcycling was, it was always going to be cold, it was always going to be wet, and it was always going to be a little bit sweaty. 20 years later, I knew no more about gear than I did when I started out. In fact, it was probably that that caused me, once I started to learn more about motorcycle gear, to want to go out and to explain to others that motorcycling didn't always have to be unpleasant. And so, even though we pitched this video at newbies and beginners, there are probably lots of bikers out there who would deepen their understanding by sticking with us, because there are lots of misconceptions about motorcycle gear. Anyway, let's get into it. Despite what a lot of bikers, and even I would suggest a lot of our customers, think, the primary role of a motorcycle jacket is not about making us look dashing and handsome. A motorcycle jacket has two main functions. The first is to protect us in the event of an accident. The second is to protect us from the elements. And in many ways, the second is every bit as important as the first. But let's talk about the accident side first. Again, there are two ways in which a motorcycle jacket can provide protection. The first is the abrasion resistance of the jacket's outer chassis. If we end up hitting the ground and sliding down the road, we want to delay that point at which the rough tarmac starts to work its way through our skin, our tendons, muscle and bone. We'll come back to talk about this in greater detail a little bit later. The other way a motorcycle jacket can protect us in the event of an accident is to provide protection from impacts. I'm talking about the kind of impacts that happen when we go over the handlebars, for example, and then land on our shoulder, our elbow, or our back. Now, the strength of the chassis of the jacket will have little to offer in such circumstances. What is going to protect us in the event of an impact, be that an impact with the road, a car, a tree, a wall, or whatever, is the armor that is fitted into the jacket. You can wear the world's most abrasion-resistant leather jacket, but it will count for nothing if you hit something. If you buy a motorcycle jacket in the shops, it will nearly always come with armour in the shoulders and the elbows. Confusingly, however, there are some exceptions. Some jackets will come as standard with back protectors, but nearly all jackets will come with the option to fit one. Now, armour, it has to be said, is a whole subject in its own right. And indeed, we have done a video about how armour works. But basically, armour is made from compounds that are designed to absorb and dissipate the energy, the force of an impact. Obviously, armour has its limits, but the idea is to help prevent broken bones. But armour plays another vital role that is less talked about. It will add significantly to the abrasion resistance of the garment you're wearing, whether that's a jacket or a pant. If you're sliding down the road on your back, for example, a back protector in the jacket will significantly delay that point that we were talking about earlier. So armour is a vitally important part of the, as it were, of the protection equation. And these days, armour is so much nicer and easier to wear than it used to be. Some modern armour is so thin and pliable, you'll hardly even know you're wearing it. Well, that is obviously until things go wrong. What you should know is that there are two safety standards when it comes to armour. There's level one and there's level two. Level two absorbs twice as much energy in an impact, so obviously it's better. But that will come at the price perhaps of greater bulk and less comfort. 
There is another factor at play here. Some protectors are no larger than a beer mat. Some of it is huge. The bigger stuff is going to be more protective, both in terms of impacts, but also abrasion, because it's going to cover a larger area of the body. But what it comes down to, it's all about choosing what is appropriate for your level of riding. And what I would say is that if you've got a Bonneville and you potter about the hills on a Sunday morning, then you really don't need level two armor. Honestly, you don't. The other protection that can be provided by a motorcycle jacket is protection from the elements. That is to say, the weather. And it's our view that this kind of protection can be as important in certain circumstances, even more important than protection from comings together. These days, there's a lot of talk about what we call passive safety. This is about creating a comfortable environment for the rider so that he or she can put all of his or her energies into riding safely. In this way, you can better avoid having an accident in the first place. With active safety bomb, by contrast, the priority is to surround our body with ever greater layers of protective materials. The result of which will be that if we do have an accident, we will bounce better. With passive safety, the aim is to put the rider in a position where he will have to bounce less frequently. What this means is that we should be looking for a jacket that will prevent us ever getting too cold, too wet, or too hot. Now, if we get too hot on the bike, we get distracted. Our attention is diverted. We lose the ability to make calm, measured decisions. And if we're in this state too long, if we stay too hot for too long, heat exhaustion sets in, we start to dehydrate, our cognitive abilities become impaired, it's downright bloody dangerous. Getting cold on the bike is another problem. If when you're riding down the road you're shivering, once again you won't be riding well. Get too cold and eventually become a danger not only to yourself but to other road users. It's particularly important, of course, to protect the core because if our core is warm, our heart will be pumping warmer blood around the body so our toes, our legs, our arms, our fingers and our head will all stay a little bit warmer too. Getting wet is something that we also want to avoid. Getting wet in the bath, in a swimming pool is fine and fun even, but it's not so nice when you're on the bike. If water is running down your back into your unders, it's not a very pleasant experience. But actually the real issue is the effects that rain has on body temperature. And that's because we lose heat 20 times faster through a wet environment than we do through a dry one. So on a really cold day, if water finds its way through to your body, you're on a timeline perhaps to being in trouble. For a short while, it's gonna be okay. But after a few hours, hypothermia can start to become a real concern. Anyway, that's a brief run through the role of a motorcycle jacket. Your motorcycle jacket's primary function, as we have explained, is to protect you, whatever the nature of the forces that you need to be protected from. Now we're gonna talk about the different types of motorcycle jacket. And note that I didn't say the different styles of motorcycle jacket, because that would be a different discussion. We're not concerned here about the differences between an adventure jacket, an off-road jacket, an urban jacket, a retro jacket, a commuter jacket, or a touring jacket. There may well be differences between such jackets, but here we're going to concentrate prim primarily on the different ways in which motorcycle jackets can be configured and constructed. Simplifying matters somewhat, there are basically just two types of motorcycle jacket insofar as the material of the outer chassis is concerned. There are jackets that are made from leather and there are jackets that are made from a textile or synthetic fiber of some description. And we are going to obviously discuss both. Now, the subject is hotly debated. In truth, however, the facts are fairly straightforward. There's nothing really to get particularly aerated about. But bikers can be a hot-headed bunch. They can become entrenched in their beliefs and the longer that they've been biking, the deeper those convictions can run. And at times, logic and reason have no bearing on the matter. Some people are simply not for turning. And so on that bombshell, let's talk first about leather jackets. Now, leather is an amazing material. Even though it hasn't changed much in over a millennium, it is much beloved of bikers. And it cannot be denied that leather is naturally abrasion resistant. If you go down the road in a leather jacket, you'd really have to be going at a fair old lick to wear through it. Although we have seen it where the leather was particularly thin or where the leather has not been fed. Leather can also be insanely comfortable. Buy a leather jacket tight and over time it will mold to your body. Eventually it will come to feel like a second skin. But the truth is that in a world where we have airplanes that fly at supersonic speed, where we 
go to the moon where we build bridges over 100 miles long and ships that displace more than half a million tons, leather is no longer the strongest material known to man. They stopped using, after all, leather for protective vests back in the Middle Ages. Technology has now afforded us materials that are stronger than the ass of a cow. And increasingly, these materials are being used to create motorcycle clothing. Now, those who won't accept that the world is round and that leather may not always be the best material for motorcycle gear will often point to the fact that racers still wear leather. And so these folk contend that if it's good enough for racers, it must be the best thing for the road too. Well, the truth is that the two milieus are not really comparable. The one-piece race suit was actually first created by Jeff Duke, he of Isle of Man fame, but he did not design it, he did not wear it for extra protection. He wore it to minimize wind turbulence. And his view was that by wearing something that hugged the body, he could prevent the flapping that beset his wax cotton jacket and therefore reach higher speeds. And he was right. And indeed, that's one of the reasons that racers still wear leather. They wear them as tight as possible, so even at 200 miles an hour, there will be no flapping. The result is a greater speed down the main straight. Now, we've already acknowledged that leather is very abrasion resistant, but there's another reason that leather works so well on the track. There's another reason why the racers wear leather. Leather is very smooth. With a textile garment, you have the panels and the material is woven in different directions. Textile jackets tend not to be smooth. Leather is smooth, and this enables the rider to slide great distances on the track without tumbling and rolling. The question is, does this mean that leather is the best material for a jacket when you're riding on the road? Well, for reasons that we'll go into, we would say emphatically, no, it is not. The fact is that the undoubted superior sliding qualities of leather are not so vital when we're riding on the road. Now, I'm sure there will be bikers who will claim that they have slid 200 meters down the central lane of the M1. But in most cases, when we have an accident on the road, we tend not to slide too far. Our roads are not that smooth. There are lots of potholes, there are manhole covers. We may slide for a short distance. We'll probably roll over, sometimes multiple times. If we're lucky, we will just come to a stop. If not, we will hit something hard. And in such circumstances, the strength of leather counts for little. When we come to an abrupt halt, leather offers just no extra protection because that's the role that's played by the armor in the jacket. But actually it's when it comes to the other kind of protection, protection from the elements, that the weakness of leather really comes to the fore. On a relatively benign day, let's say temperatures ranging from perhaps the mid-teens up to the mid-twenties, leather will be fine. On such a nice, fine, dry day, riding in a leather two-piece or one-piece is simply fabulous. But once the weather becomes a little bit more extreme, the limitations of leather start to reveal themselves. In hot weather, leather just doesn't breathe. And so we're going to get hot and sweaty. And that's fine in the jungle, but not so great when you're on the bike, as we've discussed which is why you wouldn't wear leather if you were riding off-road or you were crossing a desert. And I would suggest it's not appropriate even if you were touring through, I don't know, Southern Europe. But there's worse to come. When it rains, leather just is not up to the job. Imagine a dry chamois cloth. And what happens when you put that chamois into a bucket of water? It's the same with leather, with a leather jacket. The leather is simply gonna soak in all the moisture. And on the bike, that after a while is gonna make you feel horribly uncomfortable. Leather's also not great in cold weather, albeit for reasons that are not quite so straightforward and not quite so easy to understand. Now, staying warm in cold weather is all about layering. And of course, you can layer beneath a leather jacket every bit as easily as you can beneath any kind of jacket or any kind of textile jacket. But whenever you layer, you will perspire, and you will perspire because part of the role of layering is to insulate body heat. Now, when we sweat, that sweat has to escape into the ether. But because leather does not breathe, that sweat cannot escape. We are going to get wet from the inside. And if the temperature drops further, you can easily find yourself in a very uncomfortable position because as we've explained already, we're going to lose body heat far faster through a wet environment than through a dry one. All of which leads us to, I suppose, a kind of view. Everyone likes leather. Every biker wants a leather jacket. I think it's a law written down somewhere that at some point every biker needs a leather jacket. And if you want to look like Brando, Presley, Douglas in Black Rain, Pacino, Pitt or Clooney, you're going to need a leather jacket. But when it comes to serious riding as opposed to serious posing, leather starts to become less impressive. On a nice, dry, 
warm day. Leather is the business. In the hot, in the cold and the wet, not so much. In general, I suppose it would be fair to suggest that on average, most leather jackets are going to be more abrasion resistant than most textile jackets. Although that depends very much on the thickness of the leather in the jacket in question and the composition of the textile materials in the jacket that you're comparing it with. Now in Europe, there is a standard measure for the abrasion resistance of motorcycle clothing. It's a standard that is known as EN17092. Now it's not, as some people originally surmised, a safety standard per se. It is purely a measure of the garments, a strength of the garments out of fabric, abrasion resistance, but also tear resistance. Now garments are awarded or are accredited at one of three levels, at the A level, the double A level, or the triple A level. The single A level is the lowest, the kind of weakest fabric, Triple A is the highest, the strongest fabric. But what EN17092 has shown us is that the leather versus textile debate is not black and white. There are out there some A accredited leather jackets and there are a number of triple A accredited textile jackets. Now, most motorcycle jackets that are sold in the shops these days are textile jackets of some description. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and configurations. And so what we're going to do now is talk about the different forms of construction. Now, we're gonna be talking about drop liner jackets. A drop liner jacket is a waterproof jacket. We're gonna be talking about laminated jackets. That's a different form of waterproofing. We're going to be talking about jackets that have removable waterproof membranes. We're gonna be talking about jackets that are not waterproof at all. And we're going to talk about wax cotton jackets. This is a drop liner jacket. Now a drop liner jacket has a fixed waterproof membrane that cannot be removed. Some people mistakenly think that drop liner means removable membrane, a membrane that can be dropped out of the jacket. But actually a drop liner jacket is so called because the membrane drops down from, in the case of a jacket, it's sewn in and drops down from the shoulders. In the case of a pant, it's sewn in and drops down from the waist. In essence, a drop liner membrane you have the outer fabric and then you've got the membrane on the inside hangs separately. Now a membrane in a drop liner jacket or in any jacket serves two main purposes. It protects the rider from getting wet, obviously, but importantly, it also protects the rider from the pernicious effects of wind chill. Now wind chill is a factor that dictates how the body perceives temperature. In other words, the faster we go, the colder we feel. A waterproof membrane is also a very effective windproof membrane. So it will have a strong bearing on how cold we feel on the bike. Indeed, as in this country at least, it is cold more often than it is wet, it might be suggested that a membrane will be called upon to keep the rider warm more often than it will be to keep him dry. Before we go any further, I want to say a few words about membranes and how they work. In essence, a membrane is like a super thin polythene sheet, it contains millions of tiny holes. These holes are so small that the rain particles from outside cannot pass through those holes and reach the body. So the rider stays dry from the outside. But these millions of holes are large enough to allow the tiny sweat particles to escape into the atmosphere. So the rider, because we are sweating all the time, the rider stays dry from the inside. It's also important because we need to sweat to stay cool. So on a hot day, we sweat. If the sweat cannot escape into the outer atmosphere, we are going to start to overheat. And so the membrane in a motorcycle jacket is both about staying dry and to an extent, it's about staying warm. But there is for some people a weakness with jackets that are constructed in this way. In other words, drop liner jackets. In heavy and prolonged rain, water can pass through the outer shell. Now, it won't find its way through to the body because having passed through the outer shell, it will be prevented from reaching the body by the waterproof membrane. But the rain swirling around between the outer shell and the membrane can make the wearer feel after a while somewhat cold. It's a state that we know as wetting out. Now, it only happens after many hours in the rain, but for some people, it can be an issue. For most riders, it's an unlikely occurrence because not many of us really find ourselves in, say, four or more hours of rain, which is why we still think that this form of construction, the drop liner jacket, is the best option for 90% of riders.
The form of construction for a motorcycle jacket that overcomes this wetting out issue is known as laminated. Now with a laminated jacket, the membrane, in essence the same membrane, is bonded or heat sealed to the inside of the outer chassis of the jacket. With a laminated jacket, water cannot pass through the fabric because it is backed by the membrane. And as we've discussed, water cannot pass through the membrane because the holes are too small to allow the rain particles to pass through it. So a jacket, a laminated jacket, will never reach that wetting out stage, and that's good. And so it's true that in, in this respect, a laminated jacket will outperform a drop liner one, although only after you've been in the rain for many hours. There, is, or there are other benefits to laminated jackets. The first is you get direct to body venting. Now, because you've bonded the membrane onto the outside of the jacket to the outer chassis of the jacket, when you have a vent, so you have a vent like this, the air does not have to pass through a membrane. It goes direct through to the body. With a drop liner jacket, when you open a vent, you've still got to pass through the membrane. So laminated jackets vent better. Also, because they don't take on as much rain, because the rain isn't passing through the outer chassis, they're going to dry up or dry out much more quickly at the end of a ride than a drop liner jacket will. So let's say you're commuting to work in heavy rain for an hour or more in a drop liner jacket. Now, by the time you get into work, the jacket won't technically have wet out, but it could be pretty damp. And so when it comes to go the time to go home in the evening, you could find yourself having to put on, on a cold winter's evening, you could find yourself having to put on a damp jacket, and that's no fun. By contrast, a laminated jacket will have dried out, you've hung it up, it will have dried out in a couple of hours. So a major benefit of a laminated jacket is its ability to dry out much more quickly. But there is a downside to a laminated jacket. They are not as cosseting, they are not as comfortable as drop liner jackets because when you stick the membrane onto the outer chassis, it makes the outer fabric less pliable, it makes it stiffer. There are other issues with laminated jackets. A laminated jacket will not be as warm as a drop liner jacket because you will lose the insulating air gap between the outer chassis and the membrane. In a drop liner jacket, you've got the outer chassis here, you've got the membrane behind it, that gap in between that traps air, that will keep you warmer. A laminated jacket will also be far more prone to failure and leaking than a drop liner jacket. Drop liner jackets are very simple to make. They don't require a particularly high skill level to put together. A good drop liner jacket will never let you down. It will go on and on, if not forever, then certainly for a good long time. Laminated jackets, which many bikers these days have convinced themselves they absolutely have to have, rely for waterproofing on copious amounts of taping to prevent water ingress where the panels join. So with a laminated jacket, you've got a number of panels, you bring them together to make the jacket, and you have to tape those, those seams between the jacket to stop the water coming through. Now, most motorcycle clothing manufacturers are driven by the need to meet a competitive price point, and so they skimp on the taping. They use cheap tape, and they don't use enough tape because the tape is time consuming to apply. <coughs> As a result, most laminated jackets are not particularly robust. If you don't go out much in the rain, then they'll be fine. But if you do, there's a good chance that one of these jackets will at some point let you down. Of course, what the manufacturers are hoping is that they've done enough to get you through the warranty period, be that one year, two years, or sometimes three years. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. But the truth is that less expensive laminated jackets are not built for the long haul. They're produced by manufacturers who want to be seen to be able to offer a laminated jacket. Actually keeping you dry as a motorcyclist is somewhat less important to it. There is though a very obvious exception to this general truth about the failure rate of laminated jackets, and that is laminated jackets made with a Gore-Tex membrane. Now, in any case, Gore makes the best, most water resistant and the most breathable membranes, but they also more, know more about laminated membranes than anyone else because they pretty much invented the genre and they've been doing it longer than anyone else. Gore also has a brand to protect, and so any manufacturer who wants to work with Gore is issued with a set of instructions on how to use their membranes, and that's a set of instructions that make it almost impossible to make a poor quality laminated jacket. You do, for example, you have to use Gore's own tape, and you have to use a lot of it. Now, whilst we still feel that most people, 90% of bikers, will be better off with a drop liner jacket, we have no problems with laminated jackets if they work. But the inconvenient truth here is that the only ones that really do work are the ones that come with a Gore-Tex membrane. But just in case you think that we lack, for whatever reason, objectivity, 
What you need to know is that Gore-Tex jackets are guaranteed to be waterproof, not for one year, not for two years, three years, four years, five years, or even six years, but for life. And where this takes us to is a position where we feel that if you really need, as opposed to want a laminated jacket, you'd be better off spending a little bit more money and going for something with a Gore-Tex membrane. In the long term, it really will pay dividends. There is also another type of waterproof motorcycle jacket. Jackets that come like this one with a removable waterproof membrane. Now, when the membrane is in place, attached with zips or poppers, you've got something that's very similar in construction terms to a drop liner jacket. You will stay dry in the rain, but in prolonged and heavy rain, the jacket could still wet out. In truth, such jackets are probably not quite as reliable as drop liner jackets because in extreme conditions, the water can come in underneath the membrane, over the top of the membrane in the neck because the membrane is not actually sewn into the jacket. But the benefits of such jackets is that when you remove the membrane, you have something that is going to be highly breathable. The kind of jacket that you could still ride comfortably in, in even the very hottest conditions. It's why such jackets work so well for adventure riding. Indeed, this jacket, the Held Crazy, Crazy Evo, is an adventure jacket. You take the membrane out, you then often in such jackets have these huge pockets, these openable pockets that are going to allow the air to flow through to the body to keep you cool if, say, you're crossing the desert. They tend also to be popular, jackets like this, jackets with removable membranes, also popular in southern Europe where a membrane in the summer can just become stiflingly hot. Now, the truth is that no motorcycle jacket works in all conditions. The more riding you do, the more clear it's going to become that you're going to need perhaps more than one jacket. But jackets like this with removable membranes certainly come closer than most. Of course, there are times when you won't want a membrane, when you'll want a jacket without a waterproof membrane. And usually this is going to be if you're going somewhere hot or if you live somewhere hot. Again, it's all about being comfortable on the bike. If it's really hot somewhere or you're working hard on the bike, you need to be able to sweat to cool down. Any kind of membrane is going to impede that process. A membrane will also prevent the cooler air from reaching your body. Now, some jackets without membranes are just that. They are jackets without membranes. They look like normal jackets, they just don't have a membrane. But there's another subset of that jacket, another kind of jacket without a membrane. It's known as a mesh jacket. And these jackets classically will have large mesh panels on the chest, sometimes on the back, sometimes down the arms. And basically, these jackets allow huge amounts of air to flow through to the body. They are, I suppose, the ultimate expression in breathability. In truth, you wouldn't normally have a mesh jacket as your only jacket unless you live somewhere that's a long way south of here. But a lot of motorcyclists will have a mesh jacket or some kind of jacket without a membrane in their wardrobe so that they can ride more comfortably when the temperatures are up, say, in the 30s. And of course, what you have to remember is if you have a jacket with a membrane, you can always put a waterproof over the top. It's going to be perfectly adequate. In fact, in some ways, that's the best form of waterproofing. So I think we've covered most of the basics today. There are, of course, many different styles of jacket out there, but every jacket I feel will fall into one of the typologies that we've talked about here. Some people may feel that I've missed out on one of them, namely this type of jacket, the wax cotton jacket. But normally wax cotton jackets are just jackets with a drop liner membrane. And so a wax cotton jacket is more a style of jacket than a type of jacket. Although there is one thing to be said about wax cotton jackets. Because the wax will stop the rain passing through the outer fabric, a good wax cotton jacket will deliver near laminate levels of protection from the wet stuff. So a laminated jacket in theory will never wet out, provided of course that you've refreshed the wax every now and again. One of the themes that has run through this review, in fact probably the main theme, this review of jacket typologies has been the need to be comfortable on the bike because only when we're comfortable on the bike can we ride safely and potentially reduce the chance of becoming involved in an accident in the first place. And so we've discussed how important it is to stay dry in the rain and cool in the heat. But we have not gone into very great detail about how a jacket can impact on your ability to stay warm on the bike other than we did touch upon the role played by a membrane in combating wind chill. The truth, however, is that staying warm on the bike is not normally the purview of the jacket itself. Now, it's true that many 
Motorcycle jackets come with thermal liners, although most of them are tokenistic and not particularly effective. Many bikers just remove them and put them in a bottom drawer and forget about them. Now, getting cold on a bike is unpleasant, don't get me wrong. It can be debilitating, and after a while, it just becomes bloody dangerous. But staying warm on the motorcycle is far easier than one might imagine. It's all down to the layers that you wear beneath the motorcycle jacket. Now, that could be a fleece, it could be something in merino, it could be a down jacket like this, perhaps. If you really don't like getting cold, it could be something powered by the bike itself. The truth is that staying warm inside a motorcycle jacket is not difficult. You just need to layer up appropriately. In extremis, as we've said, that will be something heated. And with modern heated inner jackets, you can be just as warm after four hours riding in the cold as you were when you left home. I cannot believe that there are many bikers out there who have not made a mistake when buying a motorcycle jacket. Now, sometimes we let our heart rule our heads, but equally, and I include myself in this, Sometimes we buy a jacket without really understanding what it is we have acquired. Now, the more you ride, the more it will become clear that you're going to need more than one motorcycle jacket. But the trick perhaps is to work out what kind of riding you do the most and to match that requirement with the jacket that best meets those needs. Of course, you're still going to need to visit a motorcycle shop because you want to make sure that the jacket is comfortable on you. Make sure that the shop has a bike that you can sit on so you can check out whether the jacket is I don't know, too long or too short, whether the elbow armour sits in the right place, that the sleeve length is right, that the jacket doesn't push up into the neck, that the jacket works with and without your desired layers. And only then, only if you're happy at that stage, should you ask if the jacket comes in the same colour as your bike. If you want to see all the best jackets on the market, then visit motolegends.com. When you're there, you can check out the spec of all of the jackets, you can check availability, and of course, if you want to buy one of the jackets, you can do that there and then. Now, when you buy from us, we try to make the process as simple, straightforward, and risk-free as we possibly can. There's no delivery charge on any item of protective wear that you buy from us. Returns are totally free, and what's more, we give you a full 12 months in which to decide whether you do want to return something to us. We have the best price promise in the business. Now, John Lewis was rightly famed for its never knowingly undersold price promise. We go one stage better. If you can find anybody selling anything that we sell for a price that is lower than ours, we will beat that competitor's price by a full 10%. Now, there are a few terms and conditions associated with what we call our price beat. Nothing particularly onerous, I assure you. But if you are going to attempt to price beat us, I suggest you visit the website to check out what those terms and conditions are. Now, if in the future you'd like to see bulletins from us about new product launches, go to the website at the top of every page. There's a piece of script that says newsletter sign up. Click on that. Within seconds, you'll be in business. In future, you will receive our email bulletins. If, however, you prefer to get your information videographically, that is to say in this form, we'd be simply delighted if you wanted to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you can do that by clicking on the button below. Finally, I'd like to make mention of our fabulous little shop here at Moto Legends. It's about a mile from the railway station, a mile from the centre of Guildford. And as I've suggested, it's a small shop. It's got a small footprint, but it's attached to our warehouse where we have some £4 million pounds worth of stock arranged over three floors. Technically, that makes this the second largest motorcycle apparel shop in the UK. But we'd like to think that we are more than just the amount of merchandise we have here in the building. We're about service. We're about personal fitting. If you want to check us out, visit Trustpilot. We have the highest five-star ranking in the business. When you come and see us, we'll serve you only the finest Italian coffee and we'll serve you proper Yorkshire tea in a proper teapot. And who knows, if you're lucky, you might even get to sample one of our delicious motorcycle-shaped shortbread biscuits. Anyway, this has been Chris. I hope to talk to you again soon.